Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to our afternoon plenary. Uh, we're going to focus on the fourth industrial revolution. And Professor Schwab this morning made some introductory comments around the fourth industry uh, revolution. And what we want to do in the next hour is try and explore that in a little bit more detail. My, my, my name is Mark Spellman. And one of my roles at the forum is to help lead the future of the uh, internet project. And if you listen to what uh, Professor Schwab said this morning, what I want you to do is to think about three dimensions of what he was talking about around the fourth industrial revolution. He was talking first and foremost about technology. And it was the multiplicity of many different technologies, a lot of which are going to have intelligence built into them. And so he was talking about those different dimensions of technology. But then how that related to, if you like, ecosystems, whether that's business models or partnerships, different forms of organization which are going to evolve going forward. And of course, the third thing he was really talking about is the impact that that's going to have on society, on individuals, in terms of the way that governments uh, operate. And so to explore those different dimensions, I've got a, a very interesting sort of uh, guest list. I'd like to start with, uh, on my left, uh, President Ilvers from Estonia. I've got uh, Justine, and Justine is a, a distinguished professor from Carnegie Mellon who looks at a lot of the issues between technology and human interfaces. I've got uh, Lee sung Yuk from Korea, who's a very distinguished professor looking at a lot of things in the biotechnology space. Andrew Maynard, who is at Arizona State University, who has looked at a lot of the issues around how do you manage risk and technology. And then Bernie Myerson, who's the Chief Innovation Officer from IBM. So what we're going to do is try and think about four th key themes. One is what's different about the fourth industrial revolution. So what's different? Secondly, what are the impacts? Thirdly, are there any ethical issues here? What are the ethical issues? And then what does it mean for you as leaders? So those are the sort of the components that we're going to go through. So Justine, I'm going to start with you. So we look at this fourth industrial revolution. You're the person who thinks about technology, human interfaces. So tell us what's different about this. And is it something that we should be worried about or excited about? Well, let me start by trying to be a little bit provocative. And this has, in fact, exactly to do with the interface between humans and machines. Every previous industrial revolution has ridden in on the backs of those in indentured servitude. So the move from an agrarian culture to an industrial culture <clears throat> meant the move from small family farms and businesses to people who were forced to act as cogs in machines. The fourth industrial revolution is machines acting as cogs in machines. In particular, robots. And it's interesting to remember that the word robot means surf in Czech. And so for the first time, we have um, robots playing the role that they should be. And we're removing people from humiliating roles as, um, as servants. OK, so saying if you build on that, how do you look at it through sort of uh, your lens as to what's going on around this fourth industrial revolution? Well, I can probably talk about the uh, revolution around the biotechnology, but let me, uh, let me uh, get the uh, Justin's comment and take it as a, a very small but real example, which I've been observing in Korea. So we have this system called Kakao Taxi. So when Uber came into Korea, they couldn't be successful because of the uh, demonstration by the uh, taxi drivers, and ob obviously politicians cannot accept that. And uh, this uh, the chatting uh, system or software on your smartphone, Kakao established this system called Kakao Taxi. So now it's just like London Taxi. You just you know push a button and you can get taxi whenever you want. And both drivers happy and also customers happy. I was talking to a taxi driver and he was making 40% more income. And that all, all of this happened within six months. So uh, the company who used to uh, relay customer to the uh, taxi driver through phone service, they are all going out of business. So it's this small, this is a very small example, but it's changing the uh, business portfolio around the sector. Regarding biotechnology, of course, there are a lot of things happening. 
Of course, you heard about the precise genome engineering on human, on us, to uh, correct some genetically inherited disease. But that's a, a long-term, more ethically, you know, problematic issues. But if you look at the uh, real business opportunities, you can actually make now uh, engineered or non-engineered plant with uh, better traits through the uh, tools we have been developing over the uh, last couple of years. So without introducing heterologous DNA, now you can increase the uh, crop yield, and it's not going to be called as GMO anyway. Mm. And you can produce you know, chemicals, materials, fuels from bio-based route. So a lot of things are happening, and it's going to revolutionize <coughs> the uh, current chemical industry. So, so Andrew, if we think about it, sort of Professor Schwab this morning talked a lot about systems. In other words, combinations of technologies working together. How do you look at the, the combinations, and where's the power in the combinations that helps us to understand what's different? So I think the power is we can do things synergistically that we couldn't do before. It's almost like you have a light switch and you have a hand, but until the two come together, the light doesn't come on. We're now at the point where we're fusing technologies so we can do far more than the individual technologies. Um, and just to give a flavor of that, you think of a world a, a few years, maybe five, ten years from now, and imagine what you could do. Imagine going back to the robotics example. You have a 3D printer in your home where you can actually 3D print at least the carapace of your robot. You can put open hardware inside it. You can attach an iPhone to it to make its ears and eyes. You can connect that to uh, <coughs> cloud artificial intelligence. You've now got a fusion of technologies which is way more powerful than any one of the individual technologies, and that's the transformative nature. So, Thomas, t tell us how, how you see it, because you've obviously sort of looked at it through the lens, particularly of the digital agenda. How do, how do you see these technologies coming together systematically? Well, first, let me just point out that what has not been pointed out is that uh, this, this uh, well, if you want to call it new industrial revolution, differs from previous ones in that its rate of growth is exponential because it is making use of chips. Chips, as we know from Moore's law, whether, I mean, if the ex exponent remains the same, it's not clear, but nonetheless, it is, we're going through an ex exponential increase in the power of a chip, which means that if you have chip-based technologies, industrial technologies, this will grow faster and faster. Now, there are a number of implications for this. One of them might be just thing that there are no serfs, but there are no jobs either. But OK, that's. I was hoping you'd bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that was my main point. I mean, there are a number of implications. That means that people who, uh, I mean, People who can re retool themselves, um, well, had better get to work now. Uh, this has major implications for education. Uh, it means that people who are at a certain age will have a harder time. It means that countries that, uh, or companies, first of all, that adopt these technologies will be growing exponentially relative to even a nice linear growth uh, chart. And finally, countries that take this up in, uh, will either take off or fall behind. And I mention this primarily because I am not sure that the European Union, with its current legislation and with the recent decision of the, uh, on safe harbor, would allow the data transfer even within Europe that would be, that is the sine qua non for any kind of IoT or Internet of Things to work. And so, uh, but that's a longer discussion we can have later. Yeah, so the, there are lots of interesting things there about sort of data. So, Bernie, let me come to you. One of the impacts seems to me about sort of business models, and particularly this issue of incumbency, because I'm really interested in if you are someone in this audience or one of us who basically runs a large organization, is this an opportunity or is it a fairly big threat? So how do you look at all of this in terms of uh, the power of change and incumbency. Well, to net it out, imagine being strapped to the front of a locomotive traveling at high speed through a tunnel, and you are a business doing this, looking ahead, and you see a light. This is one of those times, because it is a revolution, where you better know clearly whether that light is the light at the end of the tunnel or an oncoming train. Uh, the outcomes will be radically different if you make the wrong choice. <laughs> Um, involving noises and other things. Uh, it is actually that kind of a revolution. You see, the reason is we are moving from a physical to a data-based environment. There's a great quote from Ann Winblad, uh, Humboldt Winblad Ventures, which is, data is the new oil. 
And the reality of life is, if you refine it, it will power the world. And if you don't, it will remain dark, damp, and toxic, and nothing good will come of it other than the demise. Every one of the previous revolutions has seen companies fall off a cliff that failed to take advantage, but the time scale is incredibly compressed because it was very well said that you're dealing with a situation where even if the chips don't grow at speed, the volumes of data are so daunting that you have to deal with. The actual veracity of that data is such a challenge. And the velocity at which you need to dis make decisions based on that data, this is something that every organization needs to comprehend because this revolution is already underway. That's the other thing. I don't want to get lost. This is not coming. We are in the revolution. If you doubt this, look at the behavior of your 14-year-olds who will sit on the same couch and text, text one another. This is a lesson that it's here already. So it's really a question of how we address it, and it is a matter of survival, not a convenience. So, so impact at business levels. Uh, Justine, impact at sort of personal level too, skills? Uh, definitely, although I was going to continue on yep. the business level because okay. what's interesting about what Bernie said about uh, moving from physicality to a data-based world is that that also means that business is going to be about distributed teams, mm -hmm. about distance workers, dynamic collectives, and that means that what we're exchanging is data over time about ourselves as well as about um, the things that we work on. And paradoxically, well, first of all, that's going to mean training people on an entirely new set of 21st century skills, which are paradoxically the very oldest skills. So distance workers are going to need to know how to communicate. They're going to need to know how to collaborate. They're going to need to know empathy and respect for people from other cultures and how to overcome cultural boundaries. And perhaps one of the most striking things about that is the ways in which these newest technologies have met that challenge. So there's very interesting work going on, uh, as an example, using virtual reality to teach empathy for people who are different from us. And it's been very effective, <clears throat> and it shows a transfer effect when you take off the head-mounted display. My own work on social AI, social artificial intelligence, uses AI systems to teach collaboration and communication, empathy and cultural respect in uniquely effective ways that would not be possible with prior kinds of um, engines. So, so one of the themes coming out of that is the, is the power of co collaboration and how you make that sort of work. Andrew, I was interested in sort of any observations you've got about, so, so how do you make these new collaborative models sort of work? Because it seems to me that we talk a lot about the sciences, but actually part of the message here as well is that you've got to get new sort of human skills and qualities into the mix as well. So how, how do you do that and what really matters here? So, so there is an enormous human factor here and I think all too easily we forget about the humans that are going to be part and parcel of the system. Um, so there are two or three challenges here. One of the challenges is culture. How do you actually develop a culture of collaboration which is going to work within the capabilities and possibilities of the fourth revolution? Um, the other part of this is governance, because of course, if you go back to De Bernie's example, with a train going down the tunnel and the light at the end, you don't have enough time to wait for your and government to come up with the right regulations that tell you what to do 20 years into the future. Somehow you've got to act without that framework. So one of the very human challenges is, how do you develop institutions that are adaptive and responsive without being told what to do by some large organization? So Thomas, what's the answer to that question? So how, how, do we, how do we adapt government structures to, uh, Professor Schwab's talk this morning about the speed of technology <clears throat> and how that, that sort of, you, you match that to the speed of the legislative process. And it seems to me we've got a fundamental disconnect coming up. How are we going to address that? Well, I think it's there already. I addressed a group of uh, European parliament parliamentarians explaining Moore's law, saying, well, by the time your next election comes up, the computer chip will be two to the third times more powerful. And one MEP asked me, what's two to the third? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think what we're facing here is uh, the, 
the two cultures dilemma described at the university level in 1959 by C.P. Snow, uh, the, the culture of science and quantitative, quantitative sciences, on the other hand, humanities and literature, writ large across the world, and we see this today by geeks who, without thinking at all about ethics or knowing anything about ethics, will devise new and new ways to track people or do whatever it is that you can do. And on the other hand, you have people who are legislating who don't know what to the third power is. <laughs> uh, so the problem that was at Cambridge, in Cambridge University in the UK in 1959 is now a problem of all of us because technology is permeated throughout our lives. So what is to be done? Uh, the Lenin question, I'm not sure, but I would certainly tell everyone to make, at least make their children learn math. <laughs> okay, so, so what, what we're saying so far is that we've got um, different technologies coming together. We can see impact in terms of government impact, business impact, individual impact. I'm just very keen that we don't look at this always through the old Western lens. So. Uh, Sonia, w when you look at this and you listen to those sorts of messages, are we missing something? Is there something other that we should be sort of thinking about? Because what we always sort of are seeing is the reality of, if you like, global connected connectedness interspersed with political localism. And I think it's very important that we understand that dynamic. So how do you look at it, particularly with your Korean lens on? Well, I think, uh, I think a fundamental uh issue we have to uh, always have in mind is, as we all agree, humanity and uh, human dignity at the bottom. That should uh, drive the, uh, everything we are doing, including uh, education for the future. And also, the, uh, if you look at the industry, obviously that's, uh, there's a disruption going on towards, probably we can put it as a shared economy. So a social commons will become more and more important. And if you look at the uh, history of Korea, that's what they have been doing all the days before this you know, high tech comes in. But with this fourth industrial revolution, actually this, uh, this uh, group of technologies are allowing us to think about the, uh, the past where we were more, more connected uh, in uh, humanity-wise and also work together as a group and family matter. So I think uh, there will be a lot of changes happening around the world. But one more thing uh, <coughs> just, uh, acting as an important factor is it's not just in, in, uh, information flow anymore. Not just internet of things, but it's going to be now physical atoms will be uh, uh, spread uh, at the speed of light. So a uh, fundamental portfolio of industry will change according to this kind of you know, revolution. Okay, I wanna go to the, the ethical questions um, in, a, in a second, but just before I go there, Bernie, what are, what are we missing so far in this sort, of, uh, this sort of integrated technology world? What is it, okay, that we might not be seeing which sort of determines whether we're on a sort of uh, right. a, a railway crash zone or not? So surprise us with, uh, what, what are we missing? There's always a balance. Um, there's a temptation to say, we'll virtualize everything. You know, I will outsource my life, basically, to others. When you have distributed manufacturing, one of the dangers is people say, well, you know, I can move the manual labor and just bid it out to the world over the web and get stuff in. But there comes a critical point at which humans have a key place in all of this. We, we tend to lose fact sight of the fact that <clears throat> the R&D, are we going to actually replace my illustrious professorial colleagues with a bunch of robots? And I would argue, no, we're not. You know, it gets lost somewhere so that, for instance, Watson, um, when it won in Jeopardy, the very famous first public example, there was an 80 kilowatt bank of machines behind a wall and two poor guys running 20 watts each between their ears who actually gave it a good fight and came close. So this 4,000-fold discontinuity in energy consumption alone tells you humans bring something to the fight, and we haven't even got close. So there's going to be a core, a large core of organizations that must remain, that make use of that human trait, the ability to do the innovation, the ability to do the research that enables this entire thing, that will not be outsourced. In point of fact, actually, with a little bit of luck, 
people will focus more on that, realizing the value in it, because this change will create so many new opportunities. You need to have that core of people to not only do it, but also maintain the culture of an organization that understands the need to invest in the R&D, that understands the ethical dilemmas that will come up in terms of displacing people at the low end of the effort spectrum, the serfs as you referred to them, but providing them with the upskilling so that they remain parts of the organization. They simply have different roles. It's much more complex than just, yeah, we'll just source everything out over the internet because we have all this data that we can base it upon. So Thomas is just going online here. He's just checking something out. So Thomas, what have you, <laughs> found, what have I, you found out? I just want to check a reference. I mean, that uh, uh, MIT review on the 22nd of October actually had a piece about, which really takes the old cable car sort of snapping and do you, I mean, cra going into a crowd and the question is, what do you do? Uh, and brings it to the, the self-driven car. Uh, the question is then, what do you do if your self-driving car is heading toward a crowd? Do you program the computer to drive into a wall, thereby killing the driver, or do you not? And so, in fact, there are ethical issues here where the, I mean, the agency I mean, is, is, is given to a computer. So, I mean, it's not as if the ethical issues can't be part of the computer. In fact, they would probably will have to be. And in fact, I would argue that uh, with uh, the, the range of issues that will come up with um, with self-driving cars, or even or arise already today with highly programmed cars that involve security, privacy, data integrity. There, I mean, these things we have. I think the technology is going far ahead of our own thinking about all of the implications of these ah, things. But you said the key word, which is it will be programmed, I have to finish that sentence, by humans. That's a key part of it. So then you I'm, become I'm, accessory to a murder by maybe, saying you Maybe, yeah. but <laughs> as a but programmer. It gets back to, it's a human decision still. If, if I could uh, yeah, go on, go bring ahead, these please. two <laughs> people together. Uh, for a long time, the holy grail of artificial intelligence has been autonomy and agency. And what's interesting about that is that in our push to create autonomous systems, which uh, artificial intelligence researchers have called most like us, there seems to have been um, a, a, a forgetfulness about the fact that we're not autonomous. Mm -hmm. We are interdependent. And so I think what we need to see in the future is the development of machines that are as interdependent as we are with humans, with one another, and that that really needs to be the fifth industrial revolution or, or the second half of the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. because it's going to be collaborations between people and machines amongst machines um, that's going to um, make a, a society that we can be proud of and that does most resemble us. And I think another way of thinking about that, you talked about uh, issues having to do with other countries, and you asked this question. We have a choice here. We can be colonizers of other countries, or we can be one big family, one big team. And the choice is ours. The third industrial revolution was about digital sweatshops. And it's my mm -hmm. most cherished hope that the fourth industrial revolution will be about respect for the various different talents that everybody around the world brings to the table. Excellent, employed. excellent point. I think sort of societal impact. So, Andrew, help us to frame the ethical issues here, because it seems to me that there are lots of ethical issues potentially going forward. So, help us to understand how should we be thinking through those ethical issues? What are the principles that underpin the way that we should be thinking about the choices and trade-offs here? I think there are a number of dimensions here, but some of the fundamental principles are where do we want to be as a society? What do we value as a society? And most of the answers to that come down to health, well-being, basic human rights. So these are all human things rather than machine things. One of the challenges we face, getting back to Justine's point, I think everybody who is part of this, this industrial revolution wants to see a better world at the end of the day. 
But without forethought and foresight, that will not happen. The reality is that this is happening now, and if we don't have some say in where it goes, we can guarantee <coughs> it'll end up in multiple train wrecks. And we know that because if you look at every previous industrial revolution, there has been great good that's come out of it and great bad, and usually every next industrial revolution is trying to fix the problems of the previous one. So what would you recommend to get us ahead of the curve? Because it seems to me precisely that's the problem. Sure. We're always behind the curve. So how do we get ahead of it? What would you recommend? What would, we, what would you do to get ahead of the curve? Um, so first of all, I would say we're really bad at this. If you just look at isolated emerging technologies, we really haven't cracked this. Um, and so it's hard to say exactly what we should do. But there are certain elements to it. One is we've got to be way more transdisciplinary than we are at the moment. We've got to get the social scientists working with the technologists, with the scientists, with the policymakers, with the regulators, with members of the public. Because if you don't have that coalition, you won't have the understanding of how these converging technologies are going to evolve in society, who is going to be harmed and what is going to be harmed. So you've got to have that merging in a way that we've never had before. And that means understanding how to communicate between between those different stakeholders as well. That's number one. Secondly, we've got to be able to have the ability to at least peer a little bit over the horizon. We will never do that completely. But one of the challenges we face is we're developing what are essentially highly complex, closely coupled systems that we know are subject to catastrophic failure. Um, and one of the, um, the characteristics of catastrophic failure is everything looks like it's running perfectly until it's not. And we need those abilities to be able to identify the early warnings of when things are beginning to fall apart so we can take corrective action. We have no mechanism for doing that at the moment. That's going to require serious investment, which goes all the way from multiple sciences all the way through to very practical action at the level of big decision makers. Thomas, how do we do that? Because it seems to me that when we look at it through the government lens, it's all basically siloed, vertical, and short term. That's not a recipe for what we've just been talking about. Well, first of all, I mean, at a most fundamental level, uh, what I said before about you know, what is what is uh, two to the pow third power, I mean, unless we get our lawyers and the people who write our laws understanding technology, uh, we won't go far. Uh, we simply won't really, uh, I mean, we can develop all kinds of technology, but much of it will end up being illegal, at least in liberal democratic societies. Uh, take the issue of privacy or privacy, depending where, where you're from. I mean, that has been the big issue for, uh, for tech-related issues for three years now. Uh, I would submit that while that is important, with what we are about, what we are already engaged in, far more in, uh, important would be data integrity. Uh, that um, because privacy or privacy is if someone knows your blood type and you don't want them to know it. Um, integrity is someone changing your blood type. I would, I mean, ultimately, someone knows my blood type, so what? Uh, if someone changes my blood type, I could end up dead. So the data integrity is, is a very important issue that we have to start worrying about in ways that no one ever really did before. Uh, so too, the legal environment for transferring data, which everyone thinks is all wonderful. We now have a safe harbor agreement. There was no data going to the bad United States. Well, the problem is actually, if you read the thing, maybe no data can cross borders. And what happens if you're driving a Mercedes with, with a computer hookup, and then you reach the Belgian border, and then your car stops? Because you're not allowed to transfer those data. So I mean, the implications of these are, I mean, are huge. And we need to start thinking about this. And I think one of the big challenges is for governments and lawyers to think about these things far more than they have because clearly they haven't. I was going to, Bernie, just, we haven't talked about market forces yet. So everybody sort of starts getting very sort of cautious about sort of uh, how we should be sort of careful about some of these sort of technologies. What's your view as a businessman about the role of sort of market forces and where's the balance act between sort of letting market <coughs> forces rip and the whole question about the ethical side. How, do, how does that play out? This entire revolution has led to an entirely different behavior in the market, which the government has never been able to adapt to. What I mean by that, this has moved the entire balance from those who have the big capex organizations to those who aspire, who basically base their entire operation on opex. 
In other words, when you want to start a business that impacts 50 million individuals, and it's going to do this in 12 months, previously, you would have just laughed at the concept. Today, you would simply access a cloud. I don't care if it's Microsoft Azure or if it's you know, Amazon, Google, IBM, it doesn't matter. You would access a cloud, you'd get five or six web designers, and you'd execute your business plan. And if you do Facebook, there was a hockey stick phenomenon where they had no, no, no business, no business, no business, and then it went vertical to 20 million in a span of a couple of months. When that happens, the market force is something that is almost inconceivable before this era because you never had the ability to operate purely on OPEX, operating expense, versus some massive capital input. As a consequence, the market force is simply unprecedented because somebody can stand up a business that shuts yours down in a matter of an eye blink compared to the previous day. What it means, therefore, is you've got to rethink things like corporate governance. You can't have a quarterly strategy meeting. It's meaningless because you may not be here next quarter. <laughs> you act, it's, it, it is an inconceivable situation where there are companies that make annual plans. You've got to be kidding. This is a different world, and therefore the market forces will now have to, they're literally, and you can see it, they're driving cont continuity or what they call, they, I love buzzwords, forgive me, I hate them. Um, like agile, you know, we're gonna have agile companies. You know what it means? It means look in the rearview mirror, you're about to get run over. It means you have to move with unprecedented drive to stay ahead because even the little person that you could have ignored 10 years ago, the, literally the garage group can stand up a company that will eat yours overnight. And that's a whole different world we play in and a lot of companies that fail to adapt will simply fail to exist. So it's a, market forces so, are going so to drive is, us. This is, the, this is the exponential effect, which is sort of driving speed, trying to put a bit of sort of, if you like, describing what speed means, particularly when you've got exponential. I'm, Sonia, I'm, I'm interested again, sort of coming back to you in terms of your sort of perspectives about exponential speed, what you sort of see happening, what are sort of some of the challenges around that? Sort of give us your, your perspective on that. Well, exponential is my favorite word, by the way, because I work on uh, microorganisms and they grow exponentially. However, <laughs> not, not to the end. Yeah, they reach Hopefully stationary not. phase <laughs> and start to die. Right. So I think uh, that has actually similar implica implications uh, on business sector. If I uh, if I take Bernie's comment, actually I had an interesting experience uh, two weeks ago with a uh, small company I asked to consult. Actually, we, we came up with the same conclusion that we're not going to generate annual report anymore. It's going to be monthly report. So I, I basically asked them, so you're going to end up uh, just writing report all the time instead of doing business. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think exponential growth obviously leads to the saturation point because you lose all the resources you, you can use to continue exponential growth. And that has a meaning. And uh, with the increasing population expected to reach 9 billion, we have to consider every single factor in an integrated manner, energy, food, all these things, right? And uh, for that matter, business has to be reshuffled for the shared economy model, reduce the consumption, Forget about the uh, GDP anymore. I hope World Economic Forum will redefine the uh, economic uh, uh, data presentation method. So probably it's going to be happiness index or whatever. So uh, we are seeing all these changes due to this exponential. Uh, so so I, I think some key words are coming out, sort of the exponential dimension of this, the connectivity thing, the, the question about real-time data. Thomas, I know you want to come back in on that uh, data point. Well, I just want to say I think we can forget about statistics. Well, not quite, but in <laughs> at least extrapolating where you will be based on your previous performance uh, is, a, is an outdated notion. I mean, the, our you know, governments predict things based on where you have been for the last year, last five years. Well, now at least my country is going over to real-time data, so you know where you are. You don't have to extrapolate. Uh, I think that one other key difference will be once we get far enough, certainly we are doing it in my country, is that after 5,000 years of serial processing handling paper, which 
a priori is serial because it goes from one office to the next office to the next office. You can dramatically increase the agility, if you will, <laughs> of governance, uh, of administration, because you can do things in, with parallel processing. So things that used to go from ministry to ministry to department to agency and would have to follow the paper uh, now can actually be, you can do all those simultaneously, which actually does improve governance dramatically if you do it right. So, so I'm going to come to the audience because I, I know that I suspect that you've got a number of questions in your mind about what really is this fourth industrial revolution about. But Justin, I want to come to you because we're a very fortunate, privileged group in this room. We've got a lot of skills and we're very talented individuals. What does all of this mean for the people who aren't nearly as fortunate as we are? And my worry is that we look at this through, if one lens is the Western lens, another lens is we're the people who are going to be able to cope with this because we've got a lot of skills and we've got a lot of talents and a lot of our children have got the capabilities as well. But there are a lot of people who are less fortunate than us. What does that mean for them and what should we be doing to sort of help them cope with this new world? Right. I think what you're referring to is this notion of the digital haves and have-nots. And, and there is the prospect of a dangerous gap, uh, an economic gap between those who earn a large amount of money and those who earn none. And um, in parallel, those who can buy themselves a beautiful body and increased health and cognitive augmentation. That's a kind of digital have and have not that I think we haven't thought about before. So in an era where machines are us, then that notion of the digital haves and have nots takes on a much more important significance. What do we do when we know that in the future um, you will be able to buy for your children not just the most expensive schools, but also the most expensive brains to use in those schools. And there I think a market forces isn't enough, that we have to remember to invest in people and uh, that digital have and have nots is not just access to machines, it's the ability to use machines. One of the things that I think is very interesting about the role of artificial intelligence in the fourth revolution, fourth industrial revolution, is that the same AI that's leading to radical changes in all of our world, radical changes in science, radical changes in medicine, is also leading to radical changes in education. And so whereas the rise of a robotic society is making us worry about our jobs, the rise of just-in-time education that can be projected around the world, and by this I don't mean the current version of videotaped lectures projected to another country because that's not education. It, it never worked in a classroom and it's not going to work any better when it's um, videotaped and spread somewhere around the world. But this same AI embedded into new kinds of educational systems can give everybody the ability to self-augment, that is, to retrain for new jobs to understand the new world in a different way. Because artificial intelligence is about adaptation, and it could be about adaptation to the size of a jar that you put in a packing case, or it could be about adaptation to a new world in which your old job is no longer available. So I like, I like the self-augmentation point. I know Andrew wants to come in um, and then... So, the Equity disparity, I think, is a huge issue if we don't think through the consequences. However, I would say don't underestimate the emerging economies. And I would say we actually potentially have an issue where the disparity flips the other way. So I have a Nigerian colleague who introduced me to the idea of ABBA made. ABBA, a city in Nigeria where they make knockoff goods incredibly cheap for the local community. And he was speculating that they're now beginning to pull together bits and pieces of emerging technologies, magpie fashion, but because of the accessibility of these technologies across the net, they can now do things that other emerged technologies cannot far faster. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to find is some of these almost marginalized economies are going to be faster and sleeker at doing this than we are. 
Great. So let's try and get a little bit of audience reaction. Um, I'm going to take a few comments from you. So if you want to uh, participate, can you just put your hand up, introduce yourself, try and keep it short, and we'll take a number of different uh, inputs. So any, any comments, questions from the, uh, from the floor? There are, I can see quite a lot. So let's go one in the middle here. There's one at the back. There's, a, I think, a lady at the back. I can, so yeah. My name is Bjorn Utgard, I'm from Norway, engineer. I wondered if you could comment on process intensification, which is going on in the process industries. Because traditionally, if you think about process industries, like a cement factory is huge. Fertilizer factories are huge. Plastics factories are huge. And so they are going to be capital intensive. With process intensification, you can imagine people having factories in their, in their garage. And I wonder if you could comment on how that would interplay with what you're discussing here. Okay. Thank you. Process I Identification at the, at the back? Intensification. Intensification, Intensification. sorry. Yep. Hello, I am Gabriel Alfonso, a global shaper from Caracas. Um, I'm only in the fourth revolution, but as the Professor Schwab told this morning, it's not about the big fish eating the small one, but the, the fast eating the slow, the slowest one. So as it is faster and very veracity, the gap will be wider and the gap will grow faster as well as it advances. So which advice can you give to, to the governments that do not have innovation in their agendas because they're very focused on solving the basic needs of crisis, for example, in Venezuela? Which advices can you give to, be, to, to make attractive innovation to these underdeveloped countries? Thank you. Thanks very much. There's, there's a question here. Hi, my name's Robert Lawrence. I'm from uh, the United States. Um, I'm having a bit of cognitive dissonance because I'm an economist. <laughs> and I'm trying to reconcile the picture that you've painted uh, with the data that we see, which suggest that our economies have been growing extraordinarily slowly, that the potential growth in the United States, for instance, is projected to slow down dramatically, that uh, investment in equipment, for instance, has been extraordinarily weak, not strong. So if there's all this potential out there, how come we're not growing and how come we're not investing? Okay, and I think there was one more question. Yeah, just behind you, sir. Hi, I'm Paul Hogan. I'm the founder of Home Instead Senior Care. And as I imagine us coming out on the other end of this fourth revolution, uh, I also imagine that there may be some advantages for uh, companies that, that use the fact that their products are made uh, and sold by real people. Kind of like we, uh, we endear ourselves to companies that are eco-friendly today. Maybe that's an opportunity uh, as we get uh, further into this fourth revolution. I'd be interested in your comments on that. Okay, Bernie, I'm going to start with you. Growth, investment challenge. Um, how are you, your investment decisions being impacted by all this stuff that we're talking about? Well, just to focus, because there are many different types of investments, there are investments where economy of scale wins independent of anything else. So in answer to the original query, you can't change that. The fact is building 700 small factories that are going to do cement probably isn't as efficient. Having said that, there is a lesson from the steel industry that actually some of the small mills that were more nimble and could adapt more quickly ate some of the huge mills that didn't adapt at all. But the counterpoint to that, to what you're getting at, is when you're running a large enterprise, you still need to be data-driven at the velocity it arrives. That's usually what kills people. It's not that they don't know what the right thing is to do. But the decision mechanisms are so painfully slow and burdened, no, I'm not talking about government yet, that what happens is you wind up lagging behind the curve and a small, nimble organization that doesn't have history to overcome can defeat you. So what eventually happens is you need to either adapt the same modus operandi, where you learn fast, you fail fast, you just try it again, or you disappear. It is that cut and dried, and it's a very 
That is a market force. Nobody actually wants to go out of business. I haven't found a lot of people volunteering for unemployment and you know, dispersing 400,000 employees, but it forces you to make dramatic changes in the time at which you execute, because otherwise you will not survive. And that, that is a market force. Yeah, Thomas? I'll say I'm not an economist, but, when I, but let's face it, what we're talking about are phenomena that we observe, but they're actually at a, I mean, they're not really widespread yet. So I think that's one reason why you don't see this growth. I would also say that if you take previous industrial revolutions, they will also have secondary effects. I mean, until Henry Ford invented the production line and there were enough cars, um, there was no need for construction companies to build overpasses. There never were overpasses until you had lots of cars. So that's. So I think that's one reason. I think another reason in the future for lack of GDP growth um, is that you will have, uh, you'll see a lot of people without jobs. I mean, this is the thing we're worrying about, and McAfee has in his book two year, from two years ago, I guess. I mean, the problem is that you will, you will actually not need as many people who we'll produce a lot of things with robotics and with newer technologies, and that are people that, I mean, a lot of manual labor will be replaced. And what to do with that? That will be a drag on society. So, saying, what, what about the speed issue, the fast versus slow, the whole question about the sort of the, the faster we're going to eat, the slower? Not always. Not a, I don't think more? so, because, uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, all different uh, business types, faster ones sometimes eat less faster one, but uh, not always the slow one. I think uh, if you have this uh, solid uh, business model, that cannot be just changed by this fashionable, upcoming, fast-moving thing. They might disappear in a couple of years, and then the consumers choose the uh, old ones. But I want to comment on different one. That's uh, process intensification, though, because it's somewhat linked. If you compare with uh, world energy consumption, human beings use about 13 billion ton of oil equivalent per year. And unfortunately, 87% comes from fossil resources. So we are just burning it to, uh, to the air. And the renewables, we talk a lot, but it's still only 2.4%. So if you look at the, uh, this large scale production of plastics, steel, etc., everything starts with the energy input, right? But this energy input will fundamentally change over the whatever number of years. And I'm very curious about the results of COP21. But uh, if you change the energy source, obviously that will uh, reshuffle the structure of this uh, such large-scale production facilities. Maybe this can be a little bit more uh, 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 distributed, or maybe it's uh, staying in the same manner, but they just use different routes. So instead of uh, petroleum, they just use, for example, biomass. So we will see a lot of changes, but again, it depends on the uh, circumstances uh, and policies we're going to agree on. So, Justine, if I was going to paraphrase one of the questions, which is, is the fourth industrial revolution relevant for Venezuela? How would you answer that question? Absolutely. I actually think, um, like, like you said, that it's the same answer to the question about economics as it is to the question about Venezuela. So you can imagine um, that it takes a truck a long time to stop when it sees a dead end in front of it and has to decide whether to keep going into the dead end or to turn right. And I think in some sense that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the large come slowly to a halt, replaced by, and I know you're going to love this, Bernie, the nimble <laughs> taking a quick right turn or left turn into a kind of business where there's a 3D printer in somebody's garage. And I think the same issue holds for smaller countries that have typically not had the development capabilities of larger but slower um, countries. So for example, the use of mobile devices is much larger in what we think of as the developing nations than it is in what we think of as the developed nations. And because of that, most of the economic innovation around mobile devices has happened in those um, developing nations, which I think is really interesting. 
Okay, I think there were one or two more people who had questions, so let's just try and get a couple more points, and then we'll go for a final round of comments from the, uh, from the panel. Anybody else want to come, come in on any... There's, there's a point over there. In the middle. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Take Murphy from the U.S. Could we get three or four examples of where the fourth generation industrial revolution is indeed different from the third or the second? Okay. Examples? Hi, I'm Xavier uh, from Belgium and uh, also an e-resident of Estonia, actually. Um, I wanted to ask the question of... Um, what about so technology is all about reducing the workload for people and so indeed it's going to be putting a lot of people out of job and the question is about the basic income and i wanted to know what you think about it and i think the one of the biggest challenges is the inequality of revenue for people and i think there's a last comment at the back then thank you very much very interesting uh, discussion but i would like to bring it a little bit uh, to grassroots um uh, we are well, m most of us are excited about the sustainable development goals. How can the uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution uh, support the proper implementation of the sustainable uh, development goals, let's say, to end hunger or to find uh, solutions for climate change? Okay, panel. So we've got examples. We've got linkage to SDGs. We've got what does it mean for grassroots work? And I think the other question I want you to come back to is, what does it mean for us as leaders? So, Bernie, you've got the baton first. Pick one of those and give us um, a thought, an example, and, and maybe just sort of a conclusion about, for us as leaders, what's all of this really mean? Hmm. As far as examples, I mean, people are familiar, and Klaus spoke of it well, the example of Watson or AI as used in the case of oncology is a simple example. You know, there you have a diagnosis that it spits out, and there's actually an example out there on the web, you can look it up, it's from Bloomberg, where it spit out an answer in about 17 seconds to a question as to why a woman had a very unusual form of cancer given it was a lung cancer, she didn't smoke, she had certain uh, traits. And when they fed it into the system, it took the corpus of knowledge that it ingested, which was 3,500 books, about 400,000 documents, uh, papers basically, and about 100,000 other studies. And in 17 seconds spit out the fact that she had a genetic, genetic abnormality that had just been actually found in a recent paper that explained why she'd come down with this particular cancer. Now, there isn't a chance in the world, in fact, that an oncologist, no matter how well read, would have seen this because they read about five papers a month, not the hundreds of thousands that are generated uh, over time. And so it, it's a whole different world where it is hybrid. You actually, unlike all the other revolutions which involve physicality, this is a hybrid intelligence between the human who's the physician who recognizes that this is an exotic case that violates a normative expectation because you would expect her to have been a smoker or exposed, working alongside an intelligence. As to the implications, the acceleration of business is really the fundamental issue. I mean, we could talk about lots of other things, but there will be this dramatic acceleration, and it has an upside and a downside. The upside is you can stand up a new business almost overnight, and therefore, for the startup, it's fantastic. It's a risk, of course, for the large organizations, which have to adapt at the same pace. The other side, an answer, in fact, to the GDP question, I've always had this concern in the back of my mind, and it's better an economist do this than a physicist. It works better that way. Um, is this also, however, an era where because of this very acceleration, you have a dramatically accelerated cycle of commoditization, where you take this high value thing you've developed and overnight commoditize it using the exact same competitive capabilities. What does that do to the growth of GDP when that can happen? Because it actually has somewhat normative effect. So it's an interesting question I won't attempt to answer, but it's one I would look to the organization here to tackle. Andrew? Um, first of all, a point. I think we have to be very careful of hype here. 
Um, certainly how I see technologies emerging, it's going to be transformative. That doesn't mean it's going to be transformative for good. I don't yet think there is a guarantee that we're going to see economic growth. I don't think there's a guarantee we're going to see sustainability goals, for instance, um, addressed. We need to work out how to steer the revolution towards the things we want to see happen. Secondly, very quickly, an example, I would use rogue gene editing. So five years ago, nobody had even thought of the ability to introduce a genetic change into a population, into people, into insects, into other organisms, and see them spread through the whole population. Now we can do it. We can do it relatively easily. The information is freely available on the net. The technologies to actually write the new genetic codes are available. We can go rogue on this. What are we going to do about it? And finally, the big message, if we're going to steer our way to a better future through this revolution, we need heavy investment from leaders for foresight. How do we bring people together to work out intelligently how we navigate through it to a better future? Great. Sang up. Well, I can mention about the uh, linkage to uh, sustainability. So again, I mean, we're not going to rely on uh, fossil resources anymore. And this fourth industrial revolution and related technologies, especially emerging technologies, will contribute significantly to uh, moving away uh, from uh, these fossil resources and go renewables. That's possible because of this uh, optimization issue. So we can optimize much better than before through all these advances in ICT and other sensing technologies, etc. Plus, we have an uh, opportunity to reduce waste by improving everything, including logistics and others, through the, using, uh, through the use of uh, such emerging technologies. So I think we, are contribu we will be contributing significantly through the use of uh, such emerging technology towards achieving sustainability. Thank you. And Justin? So first of all, the, the question about values, I want to follow up on what Andrew said. Five years ago, when the AI and Robotics Council was founded, then it was known as, as Robotics and Smart Devices. We wrote a white paper uh, suggesting that there needed to be a model for the development and deployment of new technologies in the robotics and smart device space. And the core of that model was that not just technical and economic factors needed to be taken into account, but also legal slash regulatory, social, and cultural factors. And that unless all of those factors were taken together, we would not be fulfilling our own values in the development of technology. Second, an example. It's so common to hear people throw around the term, the phrase, big data. And in fact, machine learning people don't really use this anymore. What's interesting to machine learning researchers is small data. But we'll leave that for another <laughs> discussion. Uh, what machine learning does with big data is not throw all that data at some kind of algorithm and out pops an answer. And unfortunately, Bernie, you kind of made it sound like that. Throw all those factors about that woman at some kind of algorithm and out pops an answer. In fact, what we do with machine learning is we do what's called mixed initiative learning. That's really the, the most powerful kind, where a scientist with a hypothesis shares the initiative on finding a solution with a machine that can learn about massive amounts of data and draw inferences from them. Because that's what machine learning is. It's taking a massive amount of data or a small amount of data and drawing inferences from more data than one human can look at at one time. So that kind of mixed initiative learning leads to really interesting solutions uh, and what comes to mind to me is work by a very talented young faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, Daniel Neal, who's been predicting epidemics from a mixture of kinds of data. Data from Twitter feeds, and this is work, I think he's done primarily in Brazil. Data from Twitter feeds, data from over-the-counter pharmacy sales, that is drugs that are not prescription drugs, and then hospitalizations. And what he's found is, he can predict particularly serious epidemics by um, the mixture of mentions on Twitter and the purchase of inappropriate drugs over the counter. If you can use the prediction up to that point, because a scientist is looking at the data, you can save yourself from the third part, which is people coming into the emergency room too sick to be saved. 
And I would say as a final point, um, what message I would give to a leader in everything I've, I've said today, and I think most of what all of us has said, is leaders need to continue and manifest even more their faith in people and their investment in people and their investment in machines that collaborate tightly with people. Great. Thomas, last word? Thank you. First of all, on the Venezuela thing uh, question, uh, after 70 years of operation, the World Bank has finally gotten to the point where they realize that uh, development might be related to IT, and the first World Development Report on IT, or development and IT, will appear in January of uh, 2016. That's a plug, because I'm co-chairman of the group that's doing it, but it's about 350 pages. You get all kinds of things in there. That'll, you can, that'll come out in January, and I hope we able to, <clears throat> we'll talk about it at Davos. So another plug. My worries, and this has to do with leadership, and, and leadership and my worries is that um, all this is really wonderful stuff, but I still maintain that, if, that it's wonderful as long as we remain liberal democracies. If you, are not a, if you have an illiberal, non-democratic system, all of the wonderful things that we talk about here could be used very badly. And I mean, one example, which we probably don't, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, the fourth <coughs> revolution, it's the third. But basically, you know, when I was a kid, I read 1984, and there was a, there's a television that's two-way, and it can see what you're doing. Oh, well, when, when will we ever see that? Well, anyone who has a computer, I would advise you all to tape over your camera, because it is one of the easiest things in the world to do is to hack into your computer, and it's a two-way television. So 1984, in that sense, has been around for at least 15 years. Okay, so with that, as a sort of uh, the opportunity and the challenge, I think I would just sort of close by what we're trying to do in this hour is just give you a glimpse, I think, of what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. And if you think about some of the phrases that have been used, the hybrid intelligence, the issue about um, faith in people, and I think trying to sort of understand something about the opportunity and the challenge ahead is what I think this is all about. And there will be more coming out about the fourth industrial revolution as we run up to Davos. But there is an opportunity for you to comment. I'm sure many of you have got views. If you go into TopLink, and look under the discussion, there is a question about what's going on in the fourth industrial revolution, and we'd really like you to contribute, because I think what we've just done is begun to start the dialogue, and all of you have got insights and perspectives, all of you can contribute to this discussion, and I think as we've just tried to illustrate, come back to sort of thinking about the multiplicity of technologies, the impact this can have, and what it means for leadership, I think the key message that I've just finished with is it's all going to go exponential, and that is going to challenge all of our assumptions around what we do as leaders. So with that, have a great evening. Thanks very much for listening, and particularly thanks very much to the panel.